I recently learned I got name checked by Terrence Howard on his recent appearance on Joe Rogan. These are all physical representations that you've created? Yep. That are all of, the, of those things? Same things. That's the brand right there. How is this received? Like when oh. you, you talk to people about this? Oh, man. They, they first, because I didn't show them, I hadn't shown them. I introduced it with, let's talk about our fundamentals are a little bit off. There are no straight lines. Right. So I reached out to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. I saw him at an event um, uh, up front, you know, at Fox. And he was like, hey, man, yeah, I'd love for you to come on my show, do my radio, do my TV thing. I would love that. I was like, yeah, but let me, I've got something I want to introduce to you. Um, and it was only 36 pages. It was a treatise. And I told him it was controversial. And I sent him over that the 36 page thing that had the wave conjugations in it but i started it off with one times one equaling two and he went in on my treaties wrote redlined everything he attacked that i had immediate that i had talked about walter russell and victor shawberger and john keely as and tesla as the people that i looked up to mm -hmm. he attacked them but then he started attacking, you know, the one times one equaling two. How did he attack them? Oh, he was, he was, because I asked him, I said, it, I said, under what conditions? I said, it's illogical where the square root of, num of a number added to itself will equal more than that number squared. The world of science is often seen as a realm of established facts and rigorous testing, where theories are built upon empirical evidence and subjected to stringent peer review. However, it occasionally intersects with the public sphere in ways that spark controversy and debate. Such is the case in the intriguing interaction between renowned astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson and actor-turned-scientist Terence Howard. Recently, Howard's unconventional theories have garnered significant attention, especially following his appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast. Tyson's subsequent critique of Howard's ideas provides a fascinating glimpse into the rigorous standards of the scientific community and the challenges faced by those who propose radical new theories. Is Terence Howard attempting to reinvent mathematics and physics? A little backstory there. I took initial interest in Terence because my mother said to me, do you know Terence Howard? I said, yeah, I know, I mean, the actor? She said, yeah. Well, I heard him interviewed on NPR. On there, he said that, like, when he was a kid, he wanted to be, like, a scientist and study the universe. I said, well, that's cool. Okay, maybe we'll get him on Star Talk. We love talking to celebrities who have a sort of soft geek underbelly. At the time, I didn't quite know how to get in touch with him, but we met at a something called The Upfronts, which is where networks present their next season's TV shows. What brings you to this definitive conclusion that you can so clearly state that this is what's happening there? Well, based upon any time there's an electric force ha acting on something, it causes a cavity. Electricity is always pulling in from the inside. It's always trying to tighten the density. And you assume this energy exists in the flower of life, why? Because that's where all those all those circles, the overlapping circles, they represent the magnetic field. They represent the radiative field that's wow. coming out and coming back. Well, how, why does a bubble take the shape of a ball? Why not a square or a triangle? What's the part? What? Why does it expand a into a sphere? Terence Howard, known primarily for his acting career, has ventured into the realm of science with bold claims and controversial theories. Among his most talked about ideas is a redefinition of basic mathematical principles, such as his assertion that one asterisk, one, does not equal one. Howard's theories were encapsulated in a 36-page treatise he submitted to Neil deGrasse Tyson eight years ago, aiming to reinvent aspects of mathematics and physics. That's what happens with the square root of two. That's what happens with most of the numbers. I was like, how is it that multiplication, if it means to make more and increase in number, how is one times one equaling one part of the multiplication table? Now, I understand that it, if you're seeing it one time, 
Right. But we call that once. But the moment that you had that add the times in there, that multiplicative indicator, that means there is more than one. So now each equation is supposed to be balanced. You know, that equal sign is supposed to show that there's a balance between these two numbers over here and a balance on this one over here. What happened to the other one in this equation? It does not, it didn't equate. And then I took the square root of that number. I took the square root of two. Because all this started in third grade, I was arguing with my teacher because we we're talking about the square root of 100. Oh my God. Howard's approach, which he describes as a fresh perspective on established scientific norms, challenges the foundation of mathematical operations. His ideas, while intriguing to some, have been met with skepticism from the scientific community. Howard's treatise, filled with wave conjugations and novel mathematical assertions, attempts to unravel what he perceives as loose threads within the fabric of conventional scientific understanding. It's like when you look at the air, it looks clear, but you change the pressure condition. The balance of the change of pressure condition, we call that condensation. It creates clouds. And you change the motion conditions, whether it's moving quickly or slowly, it's going to become snow, it's going to become rain, it's going to become hell. So everything comes down to just one of two forces. Either you're breathing in and filling up something or you're pouring it out. But the scientists, they ignored Walter Russell's work because he didn't include any equa equations inside of it. He, he talked philosophically regarding how things behave in comparison to laying down and following some Newtonian or calculus writing. You know, he said he based things based on let's explore them naturally. And that's what I did with my book. Once what Walter Russell was missing, he didn't have the wave conjugations. He didn't have the, the mirror shapes, the all shapes. And that was because of a mistake that was made 6,000 years ago, maybe, they took the flower of life, which was that symbol. Mm -hmm. um, if you could go to my book, tcotlc.com, there's a, an example that I put in there um, on page 64. And I show the period, I show the element, the fundamentals. If you could possibly pull that up, Jamie. .com again, TCO. TLC.com. You'll see in there the mistake that they made because they believed in straight lines, because the church was promoting the idea of straight lines. Yeah, just tap on right below there. There's yep. Yeah, download. No, just go to the center of the page and right above that. And you see initial public draft, just tap on it. And if you go to page 64. On the right side of the page, right there, on the left side of the page, you'll see the five platonic solids. Now these, all of our axioms, all of our postulates have been built off of these things. This is what Euclid went down to, to Egypt and pulled these things together. Pythagoras worked on them. And these were the undisputed fundamentals of God that he used to build. If you tap onto the Flower of Life Platonic Solids things, it's gonna take you to a video, turn it, you know, don't have to turn it, but it'll show you the Flower of Life that they took this from. But you'll see that instead of following the natural curvature of these 64 circles overlapping, they averaged the space where they, where they met and they invented straight lines. Mm. They, Why did they do that? Because they believed that the world was flat. They believed the world was flat at the time. And the church promoted Pythagorean theorem comes off of this cube, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So they wanted to use all of these intertwining circles and create straight lines. Because that's how they thought everything came down to straight lines. They thought the world was flat. And I was like, oh my goodness. They didn't open the flower properly. So the next one would be the icosahedron. Neil deGrasse Tyson, a prominent figure in astrophysics 
and a seasoned science communicator, approached Howard's theories with a blend of open-mindedness and critical rigor. Recognizing the enthusiasm and curiosity that Howard brings to the table, Tyson appreciates the actor's engagement with scientific ideas. However, he emphasizes that the platform for validating such theories is not social media or popular podcasts, but the rigorous process of empirical testing and peer review. I saw him at an event um, uh, up front. And then this came in, in my inbox. In this particular case, since I basically solicited it from him, I actually spent time reading every line of all 36 pages. And I commented. My comments are in red here. You see that? So I, I spent a lot of time on it. And I thought, out of respect for him, what I should do is give him my most informed critical analysis that I can. In my field, we call that a peer review. You come up with an idea, you present it either at a conference or you first write it up and you send it to your colleagues. It is their duty to alert you of things about your ideas that are either misguided or wrong or, or there's a mis the calculation that doesn't work out or the, the logic doesn't comport. That's their job. Not all ideas will turn out to be correct. Most won't be. But to get to that point, you need to know things like what has everyone else said about this same t subject? Am I repeating someone else's work? Is this a new insight that no one else has had, but has foundations that are authentic or legitimate or objectively true? Am I making a false assumption? Am I making an assumption that someone else has already shown to be false? All of this goes on, on the frontier of science. Tyson's critique of Howard's treatise was thorough and pointed. He spent considerable time analyzing each line of the document, providing detailed feedback that highlighted both logical and mathematical errors. Tyson underscored the importance of empirical evidence and reproducibility in science, noting that any new theory must withstand the scrutiny of the scientific community to be considered valid. Let me make it clear that I'm delighted when I see people with active minds trying to tackle the great unknowns in the universe. It's a beautiful thing that people want to participate on this frontier. What can happen is if you're a fan of a subject, let's say, a hobbyist, let's call it, it's possible to know enough about that subject to think you're right, but not enough about that subject to know that you're wrong. And so there's this sort of valley in there a valley of false confidence. This has been studied by others and it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's the phenomenon where a little bit of knowledge, you overassess how much of that subject you actually know. And then when you learn even more, you realize, no, I didn't know as much as I thought I did. So then there's a sort of a lull there. And then when you learn even more, you come back up. Ultimately, learning enough to know whether you were right or wrong. To become an expert, means you spend all this time. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't just sit in an armchair and say, I'm now an expert. It requires years and years of study, especially looking through journals where new ideas are published and contested. That's what we have learned is the most effective means of establishing that which is objectively true or determining that which is objectively false. Both of those work hand in hand to move the needle on our understanding of the universe. The heart of Tyson's critique lies in the scientific method, a process that involves hypothesis, formulation, rigorous testing, and peer review. This method ensures that new ideas are subjected to objective scrutiny and empirical validation. Tyson explained that while novel ideas are valuable, they must be grounded in reproducible experiments and supported by empirical evidence. In his detailed feedback to Howard, Tyson pointed out specific errors in the actor's mathematical assertions. For instance, Howard's claim that the square root of a given number, when added to itself, is greater than the initial number squared, was shown to be false with numerous examples. Tyson's critique was not merely a dismissal of Howard's ideas, but a demonstration of the scientific rigor required for any theory to be accepted. I'm going to read you just my opening line here. It's titled, One times one 
equals two. So I lead off by saying, this is an ambitious work that is a clear indication of a restless active mind. Within these pages, however, there are many assumptions and statements that are underinformed, misinformed, or simply false, thereby compromising or nullifying many of the subsequent conclusions you have drawn. That's exactly what should happen in a peer review out of respect for one another's intellect. It opens with a quote from Terence. It can never occur that the square root of a given number when added to itself is greater than the initial number squared, for that would expose a loose thread within the fabric of our understanding, a loose thread capable of unraveling the very ground rules of mathematics. That's a bold statement. So then I, I just say, this opening thesis is false. There are plenty of examples of this that have escaped your attention. His statement is shown to be false for every number that's less than one and greater than zero. For example, the square root of 0.64 is 0 0.8. 0 0.8 is bigger than 0.64, and it's a larger number than the original. And 0.64 squared equals 0 0.4096, a smaller number than the original. To the extent that the next 35 pages depends on your stated thesis, this fact undermines your claims and assumptions and conclusions. It's not about feelings here. It's about objective reality. So at the time, I, I considered Terrence a, a strong acquaintance. You know, we hung out a bit and had much exchange. We haven't sp spoken much since then. But go to page two, and in here, he mentions people who he declares were persecuted because their vision exceeded the myopic view of their contemporaries. And he mentions Walter Russell, Nikola Tesla, John Keeley, and many, many more. Regarding your list, your list of people who have made brave sacrifices, I note that to be a genius is to be misunderstood, but to be misunderstood is not to be a genius. The work of Russell, Walter Russell, has eluded any experimental support, and the work of Keeley is generally not reproducible. Science is about reproducibility. I can have the most brilliant, crazy, fun idea ever, and if I perform an experiment and no one else can duplicate that experiment, it belongs in the trash heap. It's me in my own world, thinking I have landed on an objective truth, when in fact I haven't. That's how science works, the reproducibility of results. As for the work of Tesla, much of it had very real value to physics and our understanding of electromagnetism. And that value is duly recognized by my community in the naming of a unit of electromagnetism after him. You can't get more badass than having a unit named after you. Newton has a unit named after him. For example, the metric unit of force is a Newton. Much of the rest of his work was fringe and unrealized, either for violating known laws of physics or for being simply impractical. Just because you do some good stuff doesn't mean everything you ever did is gonna be great. I will further affirm that just because an idea sounds crazy doesn't make it wrong. The system of research and publications in peer-reviewed journals has the capacity to spot crazy but true ideas, provided they're supporting by compelling arguments and ultimately supported by experiments and observations. Newton's laws, Einstein's relativity, quantum physics were all revolutionary ideas that appeared in peer review settings or journals. Meanwhile, most of the work of Russell and Keeley had no such success with their ideas. Tyson also touched upon the role of public figures like Howard in the realm of science. While celebrities can inspire a broader audience to take an interest in scientific subjects, their ideas must still undergo the same level of scrutiny as those proposed by professional scientists. Tyson noted that being a fan of a subject and having a superficial understanding can lead to overconfidence and misconceptions. When I'm just simply stating the fact, I don't think of that as trashing. I think of that as being honest. I mean, I could have softened it, but I don't think that's what people who care about you should do. People who care will be honest with you about ideas, about thoughts. The world is changing so quickly and so is everything around us. Unfortunately, we have chosen to remain handcuffed to antiquated and obsolete beliefs. 
we have put an enormous amount of faith faith into the methods and practices of old that are as dead today as the men who propagated the notion that the world was flat. So I say here, regarding your world was flat reference, it's not widely appreciated that the idea of a flat earth predates the introduction and development of the methods and tools of science as we practice them today. Those processes date back to around 1600, coincident with the invention of the microscope and telescope. Before then, truths were whatever seemed right to the senses. Afterwards, and to this day, truth was whatever the verified data obtained by your instruments forced you to believe if your senses otherwise contradicted the data. This fact means that there's no such misunderstanding on the scale of the flat earth in the era of modern science. This phenomenon, often referred to as the Dunning-Kruger effect, describes how individuals with limited knowledge in a field may overestimate their understanding. Tyson used this concept to illustrate the importance of deep, extensive study and engagement with the scientific community before proposing radical new theories. The discussion between Tyson and Howard also delved into broader societal issues related to scientific literacy. Tyson emphasized the need for proper scientific education and critical thinking to combat widespread scientific illiteracy. He highlighted various misconceptions about physics, numeracy, and general scientific principles that persist in society. And in multiple places throughout the treaties, he's attaching a number to a physical idea or a physical object. That idea goes way back, by the way. If you go back to Pythagoras, famous for the Pythagorean theorem, which we all learned in eighth grade, was it, or ninth grade? Pythagoras was also a philosopher who tried to understand how things worked. He felt, among others in his group, that if you assign a number to something, the number can imbue that object with certain meaning and significance, which means then if you manipulate the numbers, that you gain insight into the objects themselves once you've assigned a number to it. There's a lot of that that permeates this document, uh, but it's a long disproven approach to the world. Again, there's nothing wrong with a failed idea. Now other people know to not do it, right? That has value. Tyson's observations extended to the educational system and the importance of fostering a deep understanding of science among students. He pointed out, that many misconceptions stem from a lack of proper education and engagement with scientific concepts. By fostering a culture of critical thinking and empirical validation, society can better appreciate and understand the complexities of the scientific world. Sir Arthur Eddington, an astrophysicist, provided the first experimental evidence for Einstein's general theory of relativity, which, by the way, was published in a peer-reviewed journal crazy idea. The platform to be accepted for the ideas is not social media. It is not Joe Rogan. It is not my podcast. It is research journals where attention can be given on a level that at the end of the day offers no higher respect for your energy and intellect than by declaring that what's in it is either right or wrong or worthy of publication or not. The interaction between Neil deGrasse Tyson and Terence Howard serves as a compelling case study in the importance of scientific rigor and empirical validation. While Howard's enthusiasm for science is commendable, Tyson's critique underscores the necessity of rigorous testing and peer review in the acceptance of new theories. So, in case people wanted to know what actually went down eight years ago, just always be cautious of the Dunning-Kruger effect. You put in a little bit of work and you have an idea, and then you think your idea is right, and that Einstein is wrong, and Newton is wrong, and that everybody's wrong, and that all of modern astrophysicists are wrong. That's bold. That's bold. Audacious. Bodacious. When continental drift was proposed, it was like, what? Land masses are moving on Earth's surface. That's a weird idea. That's going to be a hard sell. We think there's sort of upswelling of the, yes, locally, but 
Whole continents were, that's crazy. It would take a few decades until ultimately, when we're mapping the bottom of the ocean, we find that there's a mid-Atlantic ridge that the ridges are separating. It's like bada bing. So the resistance to jumping on the idea that continents move was not because people were stubborn. It was because people are cautious. Any new idea needs to be put through the ringer. That's how science works. You put it through the ringer, every possible test you can. Not just because it happens to look like South America fits with Africa. Any better evidence than that? Oh, wait a minute, fossils matched between the west coast of South America and the east coast of Africa. Not recent fossils, fossils from millions of years ago. That's interesting. Things that make you go, hmm, that brought some more people over to the camp. You keep that up and you reach a point where enough evidence is brought to bear on the question, and then you have a new emergent truth. But at the, the vibrant energy that goes on at conferences and the contest of ideas, that's how we roll. That's how it works. In the broader context, this discussion sheds light on the state of scientific literacy in society and the need for improved education and critical thinking. As public figures continue to engage with scientific concepts, it is essential to maintain the standards of empirical evidence and reproducibility that underpin the scientific enterprise. By doing so, we can ensure that our understanding of the world remains grounded in objective reality and continues to advance through rigorous inquiry and validation. So science is a fundamental part of the country that we are. But in this, the 21st century, when it comes time to make decisions about science, it seems to me people have lost the ability to judge what is true and what is not. What is reliable, what is not reliable. What should you believe, what should you not believe? And when you have people who don't know much about science standing in denial of it and rising to power, that is a recipe for the complete dismantling of our informed democracy. Let me make it clear that I'm delighted when I see people with active minds trying to tackle the great unknowns in the universe. It's a beautiful thing that people want to participate on this frontier. What can happen is if you're a fan of a subject, let's say, a hobbyist, let's call it, it's possible to know enough about that subject to think you're right, but not enough about that subject to know that you're wrong. To become an expert means you spend all this time. It doesn't happen overnight. You can't just sit in an armchair and say, I'm now an expert. It requires years and years of study, especially looking through journals where new ideas are published and contested. That's what we have learned is the most effective means of establishing that which is objectively true or determining that which is objectively false. When you have an established scientific emergent truth, it is true whether or not you believe in it. And the sooner you understand that, the faster we can get on with the political conversations about how to solve the problems that face us. Where the square root of, num of a number added to itself will equal more than that number squared. But that's what happens with the square root of two. That's what happens with most of the numbers. I was like, how is it that multiplication, if it means to make more and increase in number, how is one times one equaling one part of the multiplication table? Now, I understand that if you're seeing it one time, but we call that once. But the moment that you had that add the times in there, that multiplicative indicator, that means there is more than one. So now each equation is supposed to be balanced. You know, that equal sign is supposed to show that there's a balance between these two numbers over here and a balance on this one over here. What happened to the other one in this equation? You come up with an idea, you present it either at a conference or you first write it up and you send it to your colleagues. It is their duty to alert you of things about your ideas that are either misguided or wrong or or there's a mis the calculation that doesn't work out or the, the logic doesn't comport, that's their job. Not all ideas will turn out to be correct. 